Okay, so back in the session here with the third talk, we will meet Alex Orange, Orenstein, who is a cow mapper, very special profession, and a drought specialist based in Senegal. And he will talk about Garbal. He, in the past decade, he was um, using FOSS very actively and encouraging people to, op use, to use open data solutions. So with Gab Gabriel, we are looking forward to get to know an open GS tool for livestock herders. So you will discuss uh, creating call centers, I, I heard, for herders. And um, let's see um, and hear, hear more about the project. So Alex, you're welcome. Thank you, Astrid. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'm Alex, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Garbal, which is a program that helps livestock herders in Mali and Burkina Faso get information they need um, on how to move their animals. Um, but just as a small housekeeping thing, I want to apologize in advance. I'm uh, broadcasting from home, and I have a very uh, talkative and complaining cat, so he might come by to make some noise and complain. So I just apologize in advance. Um, but yeah, uh, why don't we start? So this project, it runs in the Sahel. And when we talk about the Sahel, we're talking about uh, the area between Senegal and Chad. Um, one thing to note about this area is that it's prone to a very volatile rainfall. You can see on the bottom right a chart that shows the precipitation anomalies uh, from 1950 to 2011. And you can see that it's quite common for one year to be drought, another year to be flood, you know, to go from one to the other. So uh, the rainfall patterns have become uh, quite unpredictable as the, as the decades have advanced. And when we talk about pastoralists, who are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about livestock herders. Uh, these are people who depend on naturally occurring biomass, right? So grass. For their uh for their animals which are their livelihood uh they don't really unlike a lot of other people they don't farm in a fixed place right they move their animals with the seasons it's something that's called transhumance when they go from one area to the other in search of pasture and water so they'll start in the north um, and then as the year moves on and it gets hotter they move south into more humid areas and then they go back up north when the rains come Now, you can see here uh, a calendar that shows the seasons. Uh, so the Sahel only gets one rainy season a year, July to October, right? And then so for the other uh, eight months out of the year, it's a dry period. And so herders have to move their animals in accordance with those dry periods, right? And moving those animals is a very delicate balance. So on the bottom, you can see uh, an image taken from central Mali in Mopti. On the left, it's a lake during the wet season, right? You can see it's lush, green, wet. On the right, that is the exact same lake six months later. This wasn't in a drought year. This wasn't in a particularly bad year. This was a regular year, right? So in a regular year, you can go from having, you know, lush, wet area to being quite dry. And this is an image uh, taken from Sentinel-2 that I think really displays that. This is actually one of my favorite images because I really think it shows you the essence of what these seasons look like. It's a lake in northern Senegal. And you can see during the rainy season, the lake expands. And then now we're in February, March, April, and it disappears completely until July when boom, it comes back. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an area, a lake that can be you know, enormous to being completely di to completely disappearing in the course of a regular year. So all that shows is that it's very important for herders to know where pasture is and where water is, right? Um, it can mean the difference of uh, life or death. It's incredibly important. So this is where this program Garbal comes in. Now, uh, there's been a lot of advancement in earth observation. In the past you know, 30 years, it's become a lot more accessible. Open source technology has made it easier for spatial, the spatial community to do this kind of work. But 
you know, what a lot of you probably already know is that a lot of these advancements haven't necessarily made it to the people who need it the most yet. So for instance, this data, while accessible to all of us, isn't super accessible to livestock herders, even though they, you know, probably truthfully need it a lot more than many of us do. So this is where this project comes in. Uh, it's a call center and uh, it operates in Mali and Burkina Faso and it's operated directly by Orange, the uh, telecom operator, but in a consortium with uh, NGOs, uh, local actors, uh, livestock herding cooperatives. And basically it has call center agents that have access to this data who read it off of their screen for a browser interface I'm going to show you, and they provide it to the herders. Um, uh, there were 69,000 calls to the center in Burkina Faso last year. I don't unfortunately have the numbers uh, with me for Mali. Um, the Burkina Faso call center, it serves herders and farmers, but the one in Mali serves herders only. Um, and this project has been going on since 2015, it's been active. So SNV, the Dutch NGO, is sort of the coordinator of the project. Um, a GIS company, also in the Netherlands, Hofslut Spatial Solutions, has been building most of the back end. Uh, Orange Mali is a telecom operator and Orange Burkina Faso as well. They are the ones who operate this center. They're the ones who uh, run where the agents are taking the calls and providing this information. A herders association in Northern Mali Tasakh is very active in getting a lot of the uh, field data and also has been working really closely on the design, a lot of the layers that I'll show you. And then the governments of Mali and Burkina Faso as well have been providing a lot of data and a lot of, a lot of advice actually. So how does it work? Okay, so basically, broadly speaking, you have a herder, right? And he wants to bring his cattle to Tessit. It's a village in Northern Mali. So he wants to know how the pasture is. He wants to know if there is pasture. So he calls the center, right? And the agents from the call center look at vegetation and water data, right, uh, on an interface. They get it from Sentinel-2, from Meteosat, and then they look at field data that's provided uh, by uh, agents on the ground for prices, herd concentration, pasture quality, and then they look at a map, right? This is Northern Mali. This is a biomass map, so the pasture situation. And they look at Tessit, and they see a lot of red. And then he says, you know what? the pasture and test seat, it's not great. So then the herder goes back and he decides where else he's going to go. So the interface, right? It's actually completely open. Uh, there's two interfaces, one for Mali and one for Burkina Faso. You can actually go there yourself and look at this data, play with it, look at the interface. And basically the way it works is that you've got several layers you know, for biomass, for water, uh, for rainfall, and then it shows on a screen, but also on the left, you have a dialogue box, right? That takes a lot of this data and makes it textual. Um, so it makes the job of the um, call center agent a lot easier because they don't necessarily have to do a lot of interpretation. They can look at the map, get the general idea, but then they can also look at uh, the dialogue box and get a lot of uh, the information they need directly from text and tables. And then this is the example for Burkina Faso. Um, the two, Mali and Burkina Faso, the, the interfaces are slightly different. They have different layers. Um, if we have time, maybe I can, I don't know, do a demo and show you. So what does it look like? You know, what's under the hood? So we have two different types of data, field data and remote sensing data. So the remote sensing data, we have a number of different layers. We have biomass. Um, this is collected once a year, actually. Um, and it just shows us the dry matter productivity in kilograms per hectare, right? Like literally how much, how many kilos of pasture are available in an area. And this is the total for the rainy season. And we only do it once a year because we only have one rainy season, right? After the rainy season, no more biomass is being produced. Then we have NDVI, uh, which we use for visual purposes, right? So we have the Sentinel-2 NDVI, and it's really nice. You know, you get the 10 meter resolution, looks very pretty, but we only do that once a month. Um, as you can imagine, the computing power necessary to create an NDVI image for, you know, well, not necessarily heavy computer power to make the image, but, you know, it's a lot of space. 
if we were to do this every five days, it would strain the resource. It would be a lot on the resources. And it's also not necessarily needed. What's needed is actually the 10 daily images. And those are one kilometer, and we get those from Meteosat. Now, we use the 10 daily images for the dialog box that you saw, for the text. Why do we use the Meteosat images, which have a lower resolution than the Sentinel-2? Um, it's because it actually fits the user's needs a lot more. So these Meteosat images, we, you know, we get several of them every day. It's a you know, geostationary satellite, so it provides uh, images a lot faster than Sentinel-2, than you know, your low Earth orbit type of satellite. So we are able to get these images regularly, and we build them into a 10 daily image. So you know, we get these images that have the least amount of uh, noise, the least amount of cloud cover, and we're able to provide a much more reliable uh, profile of an area, even if it's at a lower resolution. Uh, for small water bodies, uh, we also, again, similarly, we use a mix of probe v data. Uh, well, we used to use probe v now it comes from Sentinel-5. Uh, since Probov has been retired, and Sentinel-2. Um, and the last is cropland, right? So this is actually uh, a land use data set that we are in the process of implementing. Now it's on the site, but um, we're in the process of integrating it more into the workflow. It's 100 meters. And what this is is actually pretty interesting. It singles out cropland, and we're using it to try to help herders avoid areas that are heavily cropped. Right? These are the kinds of areas that they want to avoid a lot of times, because if herders will go into agricultural land before the harvest, the animals could eat a lot of the crops, and this you know, could create a lot of violence between pastoralists and farmers. So it's just something that we're trying to avoid, and we're trying to help herders avoid these areas if they need to. And then uh, what's the data from the field? What are people giving us? Uh, four. Uh, data sets. One is cattle concentration. Basically, are there a lot of cows? Or are there not a lot of cows? Um, we don't actually do a cow counting because, um, you know, if you've worked in northern Mali, if you've worked in the Sahel, um, you know that asking someone how many cows they have is incredibly sensitive. So we don't do that. It's just basically what people perceive, whether they perceive there's more or less cows than normal. Uh, and then market prices, those are actually quantifiable. That's actually, they'll provide the, the price point for millet, for rice, for different animals. And then we also have static data that we get from the state on water points, pasture areas, where they are. These are just regular shape files that get uploaded into the server. Now, what's the actual schema, the, the tools? How, does it, how do they all come together? So this is a very, very, very dumbed down version of it, right? Uh, there's a lot more steps in here, uh, but I didn't know if it was necessary to go through all of them. Uh, if you do want to go through all of them, you can always send me an email. Uh, my website's at the bottom. Uh, we can talk. I love talking about this, but I figured go with a more simple uh, approach right now. So the first is, OK, the remote sensing data, we get that through an automatic download that is then uh, displayed through Map Server. Right, uh, software a lot of you are probably pretty familiar with. Um, and then it also goes into a script client that we developed, right? That you know basically takes a lot of this pixel or point data and transforms it into text. You know, uh, if a pixel shows an anomaly of 20% more biomass than we had last year, you know, the script will read and say, you know, this area has um, you know, 20% more biomass than it did last year. So uh, we also have Open Weather Map, uh, an API a lot of you are probably also familiar with, because a lot of the farmers that we work with want to have um, weather forecasts, right? They want to know whether it's going to rain in the next few days. So we have that, and that also feeds directly into the script client. We don't actually serve that as a visual layer. That's just the text. And then field data. So the field data is actually brought onto the Orange Mali server. We don't store it on our own. Um, but that gets pulled in um, through a request, which then gets put into both the map um, visually and the script client. So this is then served on open layers, which is then what the call center agents look at. Uh, this is that script that I was telling you about. 
Um, uh, it's in French, uh, but I provided an English translation on the left. And this is what's really cool is you have, um, yeah, you have in this paragraph, you've got multiple data sources that are, you know, being, um, being shown. So like, you know, for instance, according to our data, the nearest water point is 4.7 kilometers to the Southwest. Vegetation conditions are weak in this direction. Um, you know, and again, that is just based on a textual read of the, um, of the data. Um, participatory design has been actually super important. Um, we, uh, all of the layers that you see uh, were designed uh, in consultation with herders and herding cooperatives. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, it's not the spatial community that's using this product. So for instance, you know, um, how are biomass anomalies measured, right? Like, what do we consider a severe deficit? What do we consider a minor deficit? You know, what do we, how do we translate this into text that makes sense for herders? Um, so every time we go through a new product, we have to work with herding communities to talk to them about it, to pilot it with them. But then we also have to um, work with the, uh, the, the call center agents. So there's basically two levels of participatory work, one with the herders themselves and you know, the call center agents. Because while the call center agents aren't consuming the data, uh, they know far better than we do on how that data is actually going to be used and asked for. So limitations and lessons learned. The first is that uh, we cannot orient the herders, right? So the herder can't call and say, where's the pasture that's good? You know, it's not, it's not Waze or, you know, Google Maps for cows. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is we can't actually determine whether a pasture is accessible or not. Um, we can't do that from remote sensing data and we can't send that many field agents. And the second is that it depends on customary access rights. You know, not every herder has the right to access a certain area. Like some people, there are some communities that have negotiated these access over a very, very, very long period of time with the host community. Um, others have not. So, you know, if a herder is calling from a, a village or a clan or a community that doesn't have the right to access a place, we can't tell them to go there. So that's why they have to ask about the conditions in a location before we can talk about it. And the second is insecurity. I mean, this center operates in a place that's had an ongoing civil conflict for since 2011. So this is, you know, a lot of danger can be placed on herders. So you don't want to direct them to a place that has insecurity going on. So another limitation is we actually can't visualize biomass in the dry season. Right. We can only visualize production and then, you know, you can try to model it for how much will be lost during the dry season. But uh, NDVI images during the dry season can't tell you anything. You're kind of blind. So we have to rely on field data during the dry season. We are still very much dependent on the mobile network. Right. Uh, call center agents have to call. Uh, sorry, uh, herders have to call the call center to be able to get this information. And this mobile network is very, very, very weak in northern Mali and a lot of parts of Burkina Faso. So this is unfortunately, you know, something we can't really uh, overcome, right? This is, you know, the fact that it's a call center, you can't really go to another medium for that. Also, it's very important to balance spatial and temporal resolution with user needs. Okay, what does that mean? So remember how I talked about the Sentinel-2 NDVI data? This is the Mediosat NDVI data. And the Sentinel-2 data might look better to us because it's lower resolution. Um, but the Mediosat data actually ended up working better because we got a lot more images that make, give us a much clearer picture. So is higher resolution always better? Is it worth the processing time? Is it worth the noise you're going to get? Not always. And then, you know, looking at the other side, is faster better, right? Like, do you need something every day? Okay, for weather, yeah, sure. You definitely need the fastest data possible for weather. But do you need it for pasture quality? You know, if you have figured out what the quality of pasture, like the types of grass that are growing in an area, you don't need that on update every day. That's not going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And the last is it's important to meet users where they are. So one of these is, you know, uh, we had for the longest time in the dialog box, it would say, you know, this uh, water point is 4.7 kilometers to the southwest. That's not really helpful because, you know, that's not how people navigate. You have to use landmarks. So we've actually been repurposing a lot of it to work on landmarks to saying, you know, in the direction of X village or in the direction of this known landmark rather than saying the southwest. And then, you know, for weather data, uh, are you going to do absolute measurements? You know, are you going to say 25 millimeters or are you going to give thresholds? And we found that thresholds were what worked best. Um, light, medium, heavy rain. Uh, but those thresholds had to be designed, you know, with users. And you have to find a happy medium because you've got a lot of different users that have different conceptions. So, you know, that was something that we had to consider a lot too. So, yeah. That's my 20 minutes. Uh, this is uh, me. If you want to reach out to talk about cows and maps, I always love to talk about cows and maps. You can send me an email. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Oren underscore SA. Or you can use the interface. Um, we have two available, one for Mali. It's stamp-map.org or modem.org. So yeah. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I'm happy to take them. And uh, thanks again for your time. Uh, Astrid, I think you're on mute. Good. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Alex, for for the great talk and uh, to see what great service um, Gabriel is offering for the herders. So send a big applause to Alex for the talk. And we have some questions that I would like to, to ask to you. So one is about the open weather app. API and um, the question is whether it's pretty accurate for the areas you were working with? Yeah, that's a good question. We had to test a lot um, and Open Weather Map was the one that we found uh, that was the most accurate. I mean, is it completely accurate for the area? No. I mean, we operate in a place that doesn't have a lot of weather stations, um, so you have to rely pretty heavily on the model. Um, so it's 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 not perfect. It's not as accurate as it would be in the U.S. or Europe, but um, it is out of all the other options we found, the one that was uh, the the one that was the most appropriate. We found. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And then there's another question, and um, yeah, it is doesn't it takes too much responsibility from the herders? Your system. That's an excellent question. I mean, I think that if we were directing the herders, um, it would, you know, provide a lot of problems. But that's why, you know, the system is designed that the herders ask about the place they want to go. Um, this doesn't direct the herders, this just gives them information on a decision that they were already making previously. Um, and it was designed to, you know, kind of work in the way that normal herding decision making happens, right? If they um, typically herders, when they choose a location, they will uh, call if they have, you know, friends or family there and ask about the conditions, or they might actually uh, send someone, you know, someone mm -hmm. in the family, they'll go on a motorcycle to go and scout the area out. Uh -huh. So, you know, like they already use, um, you know, different methods of trying to figure out what the pasture and water situation is. What we're simply trying to do is just take that process and make it cheaper, easier, and faster for mm -hmm. them. Okay, okay. So we have two more questions. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what skills and team members came together to make this a reality? Yeah, that was, I mean, building the consortium took a very, very, yeah, it's, it's been going on for six, seven years now almost, and it's still, it's still working. I mean, it... On the technical side, um, I would say it took a lot of trying to blend, you know, knowledge of pastoralism and knowledge of how 
you know, herding works um, with not just necessarily GIS, but picking the, you know, most appropriate toolkits, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, there wasn't, you know, we weren't going to have access to a lot of the resources that we would normally given slow internet connections, uh, given, you know, resource constraints. Um, so we had to have, you know, that was one of the more important skill sets was, okay, like picking the tools that are going to work the best, you know, what kind of setup is going to work the best for a slow internet connection. Um, and you know, what sort of asynchronous offline collection methods will be used. Um, and then in the wider consortium, I mean, it, it was a lot, it was, you know, everything from, you know, being able to work with a large telecom provider to be able to get this center up and running to being able to liaise on a pretty much daily basis uh, with herders, potential users. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a lot of different skills. And I think we're still working on that. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Okay, so there's a last question here in the questions pad. And um, it's about the data, the points of interest. And the question is, how did you collect and store widely recognized landmarks? And I'm curious yeah. about whether OpenStreetMap is involved. It is actually. Um, that was the, yeah, that was actually really, it took a lot of discussion, a lot of trial and error, you know, basically asking people, hey, do, do, do you know what this is? is? Does this make any sense to you? And uh, the first like few times there's a lot of no's. So basically we found uh, a bunch of villages from OpenStreetMap and we ended up using those. Um, larger villages uh, we found um, you know the first one that we found was um, the, the the main village of each commune uh, I, I don't know mm -hmm. how to call it in English in French it's a chef lieu so like the, the largest commune for every village every larger village for every commune and you know it's gotten to the point where we did have to do some manual work where we were talking to people like okay does this specific one make sense no so we couldn't do this for all of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands mm -hmm. of villages um, so there was a little bit of manual work, trial and error, but yeah, it was basically pulling from OpenStreetMap and finding what people knew. Mm -hmm. And I guess this data still can grow. So the more the people get involved, the more information you could get about these locations. Absolutely, it's it's still very much a you know a, a living, growing, growing data yeah. set. So yeah, okay, cool. So we are done with all the questions, and it was a great pleasure alex to hear from Thank your project you. and um, to listen to your talk all the best for the projects and enjoy the conference thank you bye bye